In our examples for straight line, double declining balance, and uh, units of production, I used the example of a truck that was bought on January 1st, and so we were calculating a whole year of depreciation in year one. However, companies don't go out on the first day of their fiscal year and buy all the assets they need for the year. They buy assets all throughout the year. So that first year, if they didn't hold the asset for the whole year, they can't take a whole year of depreciation. Now this won't matter for units of production. It doesn't matter when you bought it because that one's based on usage and obviously you can't use it when you don't own it. So it doesn't matter when you bought that one, but for straight line and double declining balance, these are based on years. And so if we buy it in the middle of the year, we can not take a whole year. So what we do to take a partial year of depreciation is we compute a full year of depreciation and multiply it by a fraction, which is the number of months that you held the asset divided by 12. And then when you get to the second year, you can just take a full year of depreciation. Same third year, fourth year, however many years until you dispose of it. And then when you dispose of it, unless you waited until the last day of your fiscal year to dispose of it, then you're gonna have a partial year in the last year too. And you'll do the same thing. <clears throat> Compute a full year of depreciation and multiply it by a fraction with the number of months that you held the asset during the year divided by 12. So let's take a look at an example. <clears throat> so here we've got the truck that costs 90,000, residual value 15,000, useful life five years, but we didn't buy it on January 1st, we bought it on October 1st. So we can't take a whole year of depreciation. We can only take depreciation for October, November, and December, only three months. So we calculate a full year of depreciation by taking the depreciable cost. 90,000 minus 15,000 gives you a depreciable cost of 75,000 and divide that by the five year life. That gives you 15,000 as a full year of depreciation. And then we're gonna multiply that by three divided by 12. So 3,750 would be your depreciation in year one. So then when we get to year two, then we can take the full year, we can take 15,000, right? Every year then, year three would be 15,000, right? Year four, okay, 15,000 until the year that you dispose of it. But let's say we disposed of it in year three. So we're not gonna take a full year of depreciation in year three. So in year three, we got rid of it on February 23rd. So if you hold it for 15 or more days during the month, you count that as a month. So that's why we're gonna say we held it for two months, January and February. So we take the 15,000 full year of depreciation, multiply it by two divided by 12. So our depreciation in year three when we dispose of it on February 23rd, we'll record 2,500 in depreciation expense. Let's see how this works under declining balance. So same example, purchase the truck on October 1st. We need to calculate a full year of depreciation. 90,000 times two divided by five gives you 36,000 as a full year of depreciation. We didn't buy the truck until October first. So we held the truck for, truck for October, November, December. So we're going to go times three divided by 12. 9,000 will be our depreciation in year one. We'll debit depreciation expense 9,000, credit accumulated depreciation 9,000. Then in year two, we take the book value times two divided by five. So the book value, 90,000 is the cost. Since we took 9,000 depreciation in year one, the book value is now 81,000. 81,000 times two fifths gives us 32,400. That would be our depreciation in year two since we held it for the whole year. But then again, we come to year three, we dispose of it on February 23rd. So our accumulated depreciation, we took 9,000 in year one, 32,400 in year two, so we've taken 41,400. So 90,000 minus 41,400, that's the cost minus the accumulated depreciation. The other way you could have gotten there 
would have been taking last period's book value of 81,000 and subtracting the 32,400. Okay. So that gets us to our book value. So our book value is a 90,000 minus the accumulated depreciation, 41,400. 48,600 times two divided by five. That gives you 19,440 as a full year of depreciation. We can't take a full year because we got rid of it on February 23rd, so we only held it for two months. So be before we record the disposal, we're gonna record the depreciation expense by taking the full year of depreciation, multiplying it by two over 12, that gives us 3,240. That would be our partial year depreciation for year three. Okay. And so we know that's what we need to do. We need to record a partial year when you place it in service in the first year in the middle of the year. And then you also have to record a partial year of depreciation in the year you dispose of it if you dispose of it before the end of the year. But then after you dispose of the fixed asset, I'm sorry, after you record the depreciation on the fixed asset, then you have to record the disposal. We have three ways we can dispose of a fixed asset. We can discard it, we can sell it, we can exchange it. Okay. So when we have a disposal, the first thing we have to do is bring the depreciation up to date. So we have to record depreciation from the start of the year until the disposal date. All right, so take a full year of depreciation and multiply it by the number of months from the start of the year to the deposed disposal date divided by 12. Debit depreciation expense and credit accumulated depreciation. Because it's really important that we have the up-to-date accumulated depreciation because we are going to be removing the asset that we're disposing and it's a related accumulated appreciation. We need to take that off of our books. We'll record any cash received if we had a sale. If we had a trade-in, we could have paid cash, but we're not gonna spend time on trade-ins. And then we also have to record any gain or loss. So to calculate whether we have a gain or loss when we dispose of a fixed asset, we compare what we're receiving for the disposal to the book value. That's why we have to have our depre accumulated depreciation recorded up to date. Okay, we have to record depreciation before we can record the disposal. Okay. So what we're receiving, if we're selling it, the cash we're receiving is gonna be compared to the book value. If the cash we're receiving from the sale is more than the book value, we have a gain. If we're, the cash we're receiving is less than the book value, we have a loss. If we're just throwing it away, if we're just discarding of it, we're getting nothing for it. So compare nothing to the book value. If there's book value, there's gonna be a loss when you discard a plant asset. So let's take a look at that. We're discarding a plant asset. First thing you do is you record the partial year depreciation from the start of the period until the disposal date. Then we make the journal entry to record the disposal. Okay. So whatever you're disposing, equipment, building, computer, truck, we're going to credit that account for the cost of what you're disposing. That'll zero it out, right? Because equipment, building, computer, truck, they all have debit balances. So if we credit it, we're zeroing out. We also need to zero out the accumulated appreciation related to that fixed asset. So accumulated appreciation has a credit balance, so if we debit it, it's, we're gonna zero it out. So we're gonna debit the accumulated depreciation. And then, if there's a book value, we'll debit loss on disposal. If the asset's fully depreciated and there's no book value, then there will be no loss, right? There's never gonna be a gain. If we sell an asset, we bring the depreciation up to date, we get the updated book value, compare the selling price to the book value to de determine the gain or the loss. So then our journal entry to record the disposal, we debit cash, 
we debit accumulated depreciation, we credit the fixed asset that we're disposing of. If the book value is more than the cash we're receiving, we're going to have to debit a loss. The loss will be the difference between the book value and the selling price. Right? And I remember that the, a loss is debited, a loss is like an expense. If the selling price is more than the book value, then you'll credit a gain. And I think of a gain being like revenue. So that's why you know that you got to credit the gain. So that's how we record the disposal of our assets. The last thing we want to look at are oops, our intangible assets. So these are things that we own and they're not things that anything that you can physically hold on to. So they're basically the rights to things. So here's examples, patent, copyright, trademark, goodwill. And so with our plant assets, we allocated the cost through depreciation. If it's an intangible asset and has a definite useful life, we'll allocate the cost of the intangible asset through amortization. And amortization is just like straight line depreciation. However, some of our intangible assets will have an indefinite life, so we will not be allocating the cost. But if the fair value of the intangible asset drops, then we'll record that decline in value as a loss from impairment. So every year you will be following and there are accounting principles that guide you on how to value your intangible assets. And as I said, you'll be looking to see if, if it increases, you don't do anything, but if it decreases, the fair value decreases, then we record a loss from impairment. So when we're dealing with a patent, that's uh, something that you would get if you invent something. So you can have the right to produce and sell the good for 20 years. Okay. You'll amortize the patent, though, over the expected usefulness. I've had uh, some paralegal students who have explained to me that, you know, the patent doesn't necessarily last 20 years. A lot of times someone, uh, that there's competitors that can circumvent your patent. They change it just enough that they can enter the market with a similar product. Um, so that's why patents don't typically have an economic life of the full 20 years. We will amortize the patent over its economic life, which we, again, we'll have to estimate. So we'll debit amortization expense. And usually we don't have an accumulated amortization. Usually we credit the intangible asset directly. So usually when you're, you're looking at, in this case, the patent account, the patent account will show the book value. So here's an example. We acquired a patent for 300,000. We acquired it at the beginning of the year. It expires in 20 years, but it's expected to have value for five years. So we record the amortization. We're gonna take the 300,000, divide it by 20. That's gonna give us amortization expense of 60,000. Credit the patent for 60,000. So then the book value of the patent now would become 240,000. Now, if we were acquired the patent during the year, we would have to take this 60,000 full year amortization and multiply it by the number of months from when you acquired the patent to the end of the year, divided by 12, All right? So again, if we had acquired the patent on October 1st, the way we did with the truck, we would take the 60,000 and multiply it by three over 12. Same with if you would have bought it on, let's say, or acquired it on, let's say, July 1st. Then we would have held the patent for six months out of the year. We would have taken the 60,000, multiply that by six over 12. So then 30,000 would have been our amortization. Copyright. So this is um, what you acquire when you have... Um, a creative work, so books are copyrighted, art, music is copyrighted, and we'll amortize it again over the useful life. Even though the copyright um, extends for 70 years beyond the author's death, we use the economic life and we'll record amortization, same way as we did with the patent. A trademark, so this is a symbol that identifies the business, right? So um, people 
Well, think of the Nike 